Hey everyone, it's Shaylin and I'm here today with another writing video. So in today's video, I'm going to be talking about point of view, which as you may know, is like my favorite topic within writing. For some reason, you'd think it'd be something like character or like plot, like something normal and fun, but no, I just have this weird obsession with point of view. I think of it constantly. It finds me in my dreams. So the topic on the table for today is unconventional points of view. In the past, I've made a couple videos on point of view that probably would be good um, prefaces to this one. I have one that's the ultimate guide to tense and point of view and it covers kind of like your standard point of views, first person, second person, third person, in both past and present tense, and also kind of like my theory and philosophy behind point of view and how to choose it. I have one on second person and I have one on psychic distance. Today though, I'm gonna to be talking about unconventional points of view because as much as I love point of view, if there's one thing I love even more, it's like weird point of views, playing with point of view and experimenting with point of view. Um, the way I see point of view is that it's not something you choose, it's something that you build and actively construct. And the way I see it, every single time you write a piece, it's the point of view is unique to that piece. You were never using the same point of view twice. Of course, there are going to be different point of views that fall under the umbrella of first person. You know, you can read 15 books that are first person, so they all technically fall under the category of first person, but they are all a different point of view because they're set up differently and they come from a different place. Point of view is kind of the angle. It's not like you just have three angles you can tell a story from. You have infinite angles you can tell a story from. Seeing point of view as something that you actively construct kind of helps you realize that it's genuinely infinite and it's not just this simple set of choices that you may have been taught in English class. When talking about craft, you might simplify it and say, first person does this or has these qualities. Really, first person can kind of have any qualities. It has whatever qualities you uniquely construct and give it in that case. This video is gonna be about unconventional point of views, eight unconventional point of views that you can try in your writing, lots of them that I've experimented with myself. But really, there are endless unconventional point of views because point of view can be whatever you need it to be, whatever you construct it to be. If you wanna get used to and really understand the flexibility of point of view, a really good way to do that is to try writing in some of these point of views that are very unconventional and trying that will kind of give you the avenue to explore point of view more and see how malleable it is and eventually you'll get comfortable to the point where you can kind of construct the unique point of view you need for your story whether that's a more classic third person limited past tense that is still unique to the piece it might just feel more traditional or whether it's something incredibly wacky and strange that i cannot even conceive of really do whatever your heart desires Ultimately, you can create literally any point of view and do whatever you want with point of view as long as it's logical and consistent or even inconsistent, but like consistently inconsistent. Short stories are really the way to learn here. I hadn't really experimented much with point of view before I started writing short stories because novels don't give you as much opportunity to do that. You're kind of locked into one point of view for the whole novel or at least one point of view pattern, even if you're mixing multiple Whereas with short stories, you really get the chance to try everything. When I was writing novels when I was younger, almost everything I wrote was first person present tense, and I'd written one novel in third person past tense. But when I started writing short stories, it gave me the chance to experiment, and now I've written in a lot of different point of view intense combos, and so I feel really comfortable doing basically whatever the story needs with point of view. I no longer have point of views that I feel better at or worse than or more comfortable with. Like. Point of view is just amorphous, man. You can do whatever you want. And I hope this video is kind of a good start to just giving you some options that you can play around with. So I've got eight unconventional point of views. Let's just chat about them. The first one is first person collective. This is also sometimes called first person plural. This is basically a story told from a we pronoun. So a we us pronoun. And basically it means that a group of people is telling the story as a first person narrator. So it would read like we go to the store. Why are point of view examples always going to the store? We go to the store. We buy some pineapples. We go home and make pineapple upside down cake. I had wanted to use this for ages and I'd never really had the opportunity just because I never had a story crop up where it made sense. Um, and then I finally found one, stumbled across the right idea for this point of view back in March. And I wrote a story called We the Girls, which obviously is in this point of view. The point of view is literally in the title. This point of view is great 
for any story where the conflict applies to a whole group rather than just one person. So it's actually a really amazing point of view to use if you want to write about like larger topics or like social issues because those topics apply to whole groups of people. You can tell the story literally from a whole group rather than having individual defined characters. So the story that I wrote that's in First Person Collective is um, from the point of view of all of the girls in a small town. It's never really explained how many, it's just all of the girls. You don't really need to know a number um, because it's about a small town where there's an active serial killer and it's the young girls who've been the targets and so it's kind of like from all of their points of view because it's not just one person who's affected in this story, it's a whole group of people so they can tell the story all together. You could try writing a first person collective from like the point of view of a town. A really famous example of that is um, A Rose for Emily by William Faulkner, probably one of the most famous examples of first person collective where it's told from a whole town and they're observing this woman named Emily. That whole story has like a whispery gossipy tone, like it almost feels like everyone in the town is like whispering behind her back and gossiping behind her back, but we're getting all their point of views at once. Another really famous example, probably one of the most famous examples of this point of view, The Virgin Suicides by Jeffrey Eugenides. I recently read that and I actually didn't know that it was in First Person Collective till I read it, but it's from a group of boys also observing um, a, a family of sisters. In that case, it's actually really uncomfortable and really eerie because this group of boys is observing this like incredible tragedy with just fascination and no empathy. So it's really disturbing and quite eerie. And in that case, you know, we even get individual characters within the group of boys kind of splinter off at certain points. It's kind of like the group talking about one within the group at that point. So the point of view is maintained, but like let's say one of the boys is named Andrew and there's a specific part of the story where Andrew is doing something particular to Andrew, the point of view might shift and kind of read like it's third person for a little bit. It's kind of complicated to explain, but you can check out that book if you're interested in it. You can even do it from really small groups. You could do it from like the point of view of a family. The Water Cure by Sophie McIntosh does it from the point of view of three sisters in some of the sections. Grief is a Thing with Feathers by Max Porter does it for two brothers. It doesn't work well for stories where people within the group can't cohesively speak to the conflict. The narrating group in a first person collective doesn't need to agree on everything all the time. You can still have conflict within the group, but if they can't kind of come together cohesively, the majority of the story, it's quite difficult. I tried to use, the first time I tried to use this point of view was a collective about a couple that had since broken up and it didn't work. I realized after about two pages that it wasn't gonna work because the two characters had such different experiences of the relationship that there was absolutely no way to tell the story simultaneously from both of their points of view. You kind of need that ability for the group to speak simultaneously. But it's a really, really fun one to play around with. The second one is one you may have heard of before. It's first person witness. So this is basically where you have a first person narrator, but they are not the protagonist and they tell the story about someone else. The Great Gatsby is in this, right? Pretty sure that's like the most famous example of this one. Um, Emma, would I be revealing myself if I say that I haven't read The Great Gatsby? I haven't, I haven't read The Great Gatsby. Um, you know what? There are a lot of books in this world and not a lot of time to read all of them and not a lot of time to read all the books that you're supposed to read, so... Oops. First Person Witness is actually not one I've really played around with that much, but yeah, it's basically when the protagonist is just not the narrator. A lot of the time actually when you read this point of view, sections will read like third person. So like if there was a first person witness novel and the protagonist was like a man named Joe, but it's like told from the grocery store cashier down the street's point of view as he's witnessing Joe, he's observing Joe. A lot of sections would read like third person because he'd be like, Joe does this, Joe does that, Joe does this, whatever, whatever Joe does, I don't know. What he gets up to is not my business. It would still be interjected with that eye at certain cases. It Sometimes it almost reads like third person with a first person frame. It's a really interesting point of view. I would like to play around with it more. You can do this kind of subtly actually in some cases. It's not so obvious. Like if you have a story where the focus is more on a side character. I don't know, it's hard to explain. This is an interesting one, you know, it can kind of display obsession with a certain character and it can give a very unique perspective on the events. It can allow you to have an outside perspective on the protagonist while still maintaining a first person narrator. So it's pretty interesting. The next one that I wanna talk about is a point of view I've talked about before and it's like my <laughs> favorite point of view. I love this point of view so much. Um, and it doesn't have an official name 
but I call it first person referral. I've also in the past called it first person directed. Neither of those are official names. I just use them and I've seen other people start using them like I've made it catch on. A lot of the time it's just second person through a first person lens is what it's called or it's called first person and second person blended. But this is basically where the story is in first person and another character is referred to as you. So if you've read my short story, I will never tell you this, which is linked in the description, you can read it online. It's in this point of view where it's a first person story. The narrator, David, is telling the story from his point of view, first person, but he's telling the story kind of as an apology to another character named Shelby. So Shelby is referred to as you, not referred to as like she or not, or Shelby. Um, like a character typically would be. She's referred to as you. He's telling the story directly to her. I talked about this point of view in my favorite writing techniques video because it's one of my favorite writing techniques. It's so much fun. Probably the most common comment on that video was what's the difference between first person referral and second person. In second person, the protagonist refers to themselves as you. You run down the path after your brother, let's just say. But if it was in first person referral, let's say the brother is the character who's being directed to, it would be I run down the path after you. Does that make sense? The reason I love this point of view is because it wraps up conflict integrally into the point of view. As soon as the story is directed to another character, there's a relationship like woven into the fabric of the point of view. And as soon as there's a relationship woven into the fabric of point of view, there's conflict woven into the fabric of, con of the point of view. It just, there's so much to inherently unpack. It can be told out of so many different emotions or a range of emotions. Like when I was writing I Will Never Tell You This, it was the first time I'd use this point of view. I don't think the story would be nearly as effective as it is under the assumption it's an effective story if it were just told in first person because it would remove all the layer of emotion that exists between David and Shelby which is a complex relationship. It's not a close relationship. They don't have a particular affinity for each other. They're antagonistic towards each other, but at the same time, there is this apologeticness because David is assuming this great amount of pain that he's going to cause her. By telling the story directly to her, it forces him to look at and unravel so many more nuances of their relationship and, di and dynamic that I don't know could necessarily be unraveled just in first person. Obviously not every story needs this. If every story needed it, every first person narrative would be told in this. Not every story needs that and not every relationship needs this point of view to examine it. Sometimes this point of view wouldn't make sense um, because the character might feel too private. Like the character has a very key relationship with someone, but they wouldn't want to tell the story to them. But I think this point of view is so effective because it gives the story an audience. Normally, you don't know who the audience is, right? But when you have a first person referral point of view, suddenly you know who the audience is and it just really impacts the tone. There are a lot of examples of this. If you want to read a novel in this point of view, Sadness is a White Bird by Moriel Rothman Zecker. This is just a super fun point of view. I would highly recommend trying it. Once you try, you can't go back. It's addicting. So the next one is first person omniscient. Normally when we talk about omniscient point of view, we talk about it in terms of third person. Like when you're in high school English class and you do the lesson on point of view, they tell you there's first person, second person, which we don't have to talk about. Then there's a third person, objective, limited, and omniscient. But omniscience could be applied to any point of view. First person could be omniscient, even second person could be omniscient. Omniscience just means that the narrator knows everything. But you could write something that's first person omniscient if your first person narrator is omniscient. How cool would that be? Some third person omniscient books are almost actually kind of also first person omniscient. The Book Thief by Marcus Zussack is one I think of because it's told from a distinct character. Like that book is from the point of view of death does use an I to refer to themselves at some points. So it kind of actually is a first person omniscient, but death isn't the protagonist, but you could totally write it from like the protagonist being omniscient, but it's first person. I heard of a book that does this, but I haven't read it. The Enchanted by Renee Denfield. I think it's set in a prison. The main character is like a prisoner, but he's omniscient. I think. I haven't read it. I just remember hearing about that. Anyways, omniscience is something I personally haven't played around with a ton in my writing, but the novel I'm writing called Holding a Ghost is omniscient because it's... This is an example of like when you get out of hand with point of view, you start constructing really weird things. 
but like the point of view of that is first person referral except the protagonist is the you so it's like a witness first person referral from a ghost's point of view but the ghost is omniscient <laughs> So sorry I'm so sorry I'm so sorry so another really cool one that you can try and I talked about this one a little also in my second person video is second person instructional so when we talk about second person in the classic form it usually is used to mean that the reader is the narrator soon as someone says that they just don't like second person by principle because they're being told they would do things they'd never do that's when I cannot hold back anymore. <laughs> that will unleash my wrath like nothing else on this earth. Yeah, I know, that's the hill I've chosen to die on. Most of the time, second person means that the narrator is talking to themselves, not that the reader is the main character. So that's usually called second person intimate, where the main character is talking to themselves and referring to themselves as a you, but you can also try second person instructional. This is also often used to mean that the main character is, is talking to themselves. Instead of describing what they're doing, they're instructing themselves. So a lot of the time here you drop the pronoun. So if there's a scene where the main character is like baking a cake, instead of saying something like you measure the flour and whisk in the eggs, it would just read measure the flour, whisk in the eggs. So it's the character instructing themselves. This can be used to show that the main character maybe is dissociated and needs to direct themselves. It can be really quite interesting. You can also use this to play with form a lot. You can blend it with like going off the example I just used. You could do second person instructional in the form of a recipe. You know, blend it with something that inherently has instructions. It has a very unique sound and you can really dig into some interesting psychological stuff within your character with the subtext just being within the point of view. That's like my favorite thing about point of view is that you can wrap up character psychology into the point of view. So the point of view itself explores character psychology Rather than the point of view just being, what pronoun am I gonna use? It's like an expression of how the character sees themselves and perceives the events, which is so psychological. It can create theme. It's so expansive. The next one that I wanted to talk about is a third person. You could also try third person plural. So this is kind of like first person collective, except you're using third person. So it's a group of characters who are the main character but it's in third person, so you would use they, them. To be clear, you could have a third person singular narrative that uses they, them pronouns if your character uses they, them pronouns. They, them doesn't have to be used to describe a plural, but it can be if you want to tell the story of a group from third person, you could use they, them. So it's basically, yeah, first person collective in third person. I have never tried it before, but I'm kind of intrigued by the possibility of telling the story of a group from third person. I don't have much to say about this one because I've never used it before, but I think it's intriguing. So the next one I want to talk about is one you've probably heard of before, but it's often written off. Third person objective. So this is one that you probably heard of before, but it's not talked about a lot in relation to creative writing or at least fiction writing. This is third person where the narrative is completely external. So you have a third person narrator, but they're basically a camera. They don't have access to the character's thoughts. So all the narrative voice can do is observe externally. It can't tell how anyone's feeling. It can't tell what anyone's thinking. This is what screenplays are written in. So if you've written screen, you might be familiar with it. It's not used that often in fiction. I, I think Hemingway has some stories in it. I've heard that. I haven't actually read a lot of Hemingway, but I think I've heard that he has some stories in third person objective. There are some short, there are some short stories in third person objective, but it's not that common. And it's often written off because it doesn't give you access to the character's thoughts, which is a huge detriment. But what is a detriment could equally be an opportunity. Think about the level of subtext that you could achieve in a story where everything is only subtext. All you can do is have subtext because you can't go into anyone's thoughts. You can only show through images. Even just as an exercise to improve your showing versus telling and your subtext skills, this would be amazing, you know? As an exercise, if you try writing a scene from third person objective and try to communicate whatever it is you're trying to communicate about the characters without anything internal, it'd be a huge challenge, but I bet it would be really rewarding in terms of strengthening your skills. I've only used it for screen, but I think the fact that I wrote screenplays in this point of view is what improved my showing versus telling skills in fiction. It really teaches you to use imagery to 
show character. I think that could actually be a really powerful tool in fiction. I imagine that it would sound very quiet to read, you know, because there's no emotion, so it would have this almost like cool meditative feel. It'd be kind of cinematic at the same time. I'm very intrigued to try it. If anyone has used it in fiction, I'd love to hear what the takeaways for you were. And then as the final one, this is, I'm just lumping this in as one, but it's anything in future tense, whether that's first person, third person, second person, whatever you want to do in, in future tense. I admittedly have also never used future tense. I imagine it's quite hard to write because we have so little exposure to it. It implies that nothing is really happening. It's only being inferred or predicted somehow. I think it could be genuinely quite fascinating. I think the risk with future tense is that it could feel like kind of a dream sequence where nothing that's happening is concretely happening, you know, because it's just being imagined. But that could also be the beauty of it, dive into a character's future projections of their worries. Um, I actually think this could maybe pair beautifully with second person, as mind-boggling as that would sound, trippy as that would be, second person future tense, that idea that a character is so anxious about the future that they're dissociating while projecting it. I don't know, I feel like that's how I think nowadays, <laughs> is in second person future tense. 2020 mood is living in second person future tense. But sometimes the things that are the hardest to pull off and that feel like they would have the most drawbacks when used correctly are the most effective. You know, if you can find the right situation to do something that is often written off, like third person objective, it can be so impactful and so effective. So I'm excited to try things in future tense and try to explore what that might mean and infer about the characters. So that's all I've got for this video on weird point of views, which I love so much. Remember, this isn't an exhaustive list and ultimately when you get comfortable with point of view, you don't have to pick from lists of point of views. Every point of view you use is its own unique construction, even if it fits under a certain label. Every point of view is different because it's coming from a unique character and every character is different. Even if it's technically first person or even if it's technically something more specific, even if it's technically first person collective, every first person collective is gonna be so different, especially when you get into really weird point of views. Using it is probably going to demand specific parameters in order for it to be used logically and also for it to make sense with the story. You know, like when I use a weird point of view, it's not just because I like messing around with weird point of view. I mean, it's also that, but it's also because I think that that point of view is the best way to explore and communicate my story and character. And so in order to do that, you have to create something quite unique and specific to that character. When it's especially weird, you even have to do that more, you know? Like when I write in first person past tense, which is a pretty common point of view, Sure, I think about the unique point of view because I love point of view so much, but it's when I'm writing in something utterly weird that I really think about why and I really think about aligning the point of view as logically as possible with my character and their psychology. That's all I have for this video. Um, I hope it was interesting or enlightening in some way. I would love to hear what your favorite weird point of view is, especially if it's one I didn't mention. I really racked my brain to think of all the weird point of views I could think of. So if I missed one, please tell me about it so we can geek about point of view in the comments. Thank you guys so much for watching. Um, if you have any questions, you can always send me an ask on Tumblr and I'll see you in another video.